It's a pleasure to be talking to you all this afternoon about a paper I was involved in that got published about three months ago now. So I'll get cracking as um, I've been introduced. I'm a final year medical student and I've recently become an advocacy author at Transbury Med UK based in Bristol. So hopefully my computer works for me now with the slide share. Perfect. Um, so that's a paper, you, you, it's been circulated beforehand, but just if anybody wants to get it um, popped up on their devices for reference as we go along. Now, it's obviously a cross-sectional study, so be remiss of me not to, you know, just in general talk about cross-sectional studies before we go into my specific one. So sometimes they're called prevalence studies and they're observational in nature. So researchers collect data on variables of interest at one specific point in time without manipulating any study factor. The primary outcome is prevalence, with the and we all know what the definition of prevalence is, the total number of cases of a disease or condition or whatever the parameter is that we're investigating in a population at a specific time divided by total number of individual studies. So that's just in general to get your minds you know, thinking about it. So in terms of the strengths of these types of studies, um, in terms of efficiency and cost effectiveness data, as it's collected at a single point in time, it's both fast and cost effective. Also, they're useful for public health planning as it provides a snapshot of a population's health status, which is of course useful for health policy and planning. They're also good for hypothesis generation. While they can't establish causality, they can highlight associations that warrant further exploration and study designs. And lastly, feasibility, um, you know, is another thing to consider. I don't want to go spend too long on this. In terms of limitations, which I'll be talking about quite a bit later on regarding my own study, um, you can't determine causality. Um, so as both exposure and outcome are measured simultaneously. Um, so that's one thing to consider. There's a potential for recall bias. So if participants are asked about past experience or exposures in the general sense, it might not be accurate. Um, this is just cross-sectional studies in general. Also, confounding factors can skew results and measuring incidents is another thing to, you know, be aware of. Um, so, of course, then, how are these applied in research? So, they're often quite used in health surveys, economic analyses, and educational research. And in terms of in, um, when you're actually interpreting the results, just be aware of the association doesn't um, relate to causation, consider confounding factors, and also, um, you know, without a clear temporal sequence, there's always risk the outcome might have preceded the exposure. So that's just in general, but not totally applicable to my, my own study, which we'll actually get cracking into now. So apologies, there's a bit of a lag between changing slides. Let me just go back one. Sorry, it's gone. Um, um, Okay, so we'll go on to my actual study itself. Apologies. Okay, so in terms of our objectives, it would take to what extent policies and monitoring systems of 25 of the largest public and philanthropic medical research funders in Europe, along which included six other funders which hadn't originally been studied by a group of TransparyMed as stipulated by the 2017 WHO joint statement, which we'll look into detail um, two slides over what we actually, what were the parameters that we studied. The hypothesis was that for original study of the European funders was that major research funders have strengthened their clinical trial transparency policies between 2021 and 22. And we, 
we guessed that this remained unchanged. But on top of our study, we added a second hypothesis that clinical trial policies of key public and philanthropic medical research funders worldwide do not actually meet best practice global benchmarks. So in terms of the selection methodology, um, so the epidemiology, sorry, our starting point was a cohort of 21 of the largest philanthropic and unilaterals, so either single entity or an individual that solely provides funding for a project without any additional contributions from other sources. Public medical research funders in Europe, which was, as I mentioned previously, covered by a different assessment in 2021. We also, as you can see from the list on the right, removed two funders that did not routinely directly fund clinical trials. We decided then to expand this cohort by adding six new um, global funders who had also signed up to the new joint statement. Um, so two multilateral ones located in Europe, Horizon Europe and EDCTPCP, sorry, if in total, if you've ever heard of it, it's Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, that's what it stands for, and two other major funders in the Oceania, so National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia and Health Research Council of New Zealand. And we also added the Indian Council of Medical Research because it's the largest council in Asia. We didn't include any from the US because there's a separate study looking into that, which I believe is about to be published by BMJ EBM quite soon by Elise Gamertzfelder. So that's if you're of interest, be looking out for that as it should be published in a number of weeks if it hasn't already been. And to complete coverage of major North American funders, we then added the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. So I'll just move on to the next slide. So then looking at the accessible methodology, so we searched the websites of all 25 funders during August and September 2022 and filled out a scoring sheet for each funder capturing the relevant policy items. The six funders being assessed for the first time were independently assessed by two of our team members and I assessed the remaining 19 funders. So given that we had such a global cohort, Google Translate was obviously necessary. And this I'll talk about later is a potential limitation um, given that many of the funders that were, you know, didn't originally, you know, don't speak English, they didn't even have an option to, you know, look at it in English, you had to literally translate everything yourself. After this, then in November, I contacted all the funders with a copy of the assessment criteria, as well as their score sheet. And then approximately one to two weeks after the initial email, we sent a follow up. And after that, then for any funder that had been assessed for the first time that didn't actually respond to the emails we sent in the outreach, these were reassessed independently by another team member. So this was to ensure that no salient policy elements were overlooked. And finally, I compared and merged all assessments into a single consolidated assessment sheet for each funder. And just you know, to add that extra bit of protection as a final quality check, we reviewed the previous year's assessments of European funders, ensuring we had captured all items. So I'm not going to spend too long on the assessment tool in terms of you know looking at every policy item individually. I'll just give an example of three of them, given that it is you know the main tool we use for the whole study. Um, it's not relevant to talk about, you know, go into every one of them, but, you know, why do they matter? Why did the WHO joint statement in 2017 come about full stop? And what's the point of our whole assessment? So if you think about prospective trial registration, why do we care so much about this? Well, it ensures that the existence and key details of clinical trials are made known to the public and scientific community before the trial even begins. Early registration helps prevent several issues, which include selective reporting of outcomes and publication bias, which can distort the overall understanding of a treatment's efficacy and safety. If you look at open access, 
This ensures results are freely accessible to everyone, be it the patients, healthcare professionals, and researchers worldwide. And effectively, this serves to democratize access to important medical information, which overall promotes equity in healthcare. And finally, the ones towards the end may not be as clear cut. So if you imagine why is fun, you know, monitoring funders results reporting, why do we care about that? Well, this is crucial for timely and complete disclosure findings. It encourages researchers to report results as required, preventing selective reporting and contributing overall to a more accurate understanding of treatment outcomes. So this next three slides will look at results, but I'm really only going to briefly go over these, um, you know, as it's not the main topic for this session, but just to give you a, you know, if you haven't read the paper already, an overview of what we actually found. So across all the 25 funders, and you'll see the EU ones in the next page, on average, they had adopted just over five out of the 11 best practices in clinical trial transparency. But as you can see from this graph, the performance did vary widely. So NIHR, unsurprisingly, was performed the best at implementing all 11 items. And of course, the Wellcome Trust followed closely. However, if you look toward the end of the graph, um, it's quite poor in the case of um, NHMRC, only implementing two and so on. So very much um, massive variation across funders. And moving on to European, out of the previously assessed, more than half of them strengthened their policies. Now, this isn't obvious in this slide, but will be shown in the next. We can just get a feel for how they performed. And again, that trend and a wide variation continuing on here. Um, the average number of policies adopted by Europe rose from four out of 11 to just over five again um, during this period. So they did, even though it doesn't look too you know promising here but they did actually improve slightly um which again kind of strengthens why we do these type of studies but there there may be ways to improve the actual impact of such studies which we can discuss later and lastly just looking at policy items specifically which also um you know in addition to that, we can also see which improvements, how they had improved on a policy item by policy item basis. So there was, a, again, a large variation with the frequency in which policies had been adopted. You can see that open access was the most widely adopted one. However, in contrast, only over a third of funders required grantees to make their protocols publicly available on registries. However, if you look at it more positively, Overall, each of the 11 who best practices had been adopted by at least eight funders in our cohort. So this demonstrates the feasibility of it. Um, however, the minor rise that we did see, as you can see here, it's quite minor. Each policy item um, typically only increasing by two to three items. So this proves the need to reassess again. So there will be another reassessment, I believe, in January 2024. So in order to establish impactful change, you really it's incumbent, I think, on all researchers ensure, to ensure that published work translates into meaningful policy. So now looking at the strengths and limitations. So we receive when in the outreach process, we receive responses from 14 funders, which when you think of it, there was 25. So it's not a very high you know, response rate. However, we did end up having to adjust ratings for 21 items. So there was 275 items overall. So if you think about it, there are 11 policy items, 25 funders. So that gives 275 in total. So it's not, um, it didn't result in a massive alteration of scores. But it, it is something to consider if you're going to replicate a study like this, how valuable the outreach process is um, due to the limitations of doing something like this when you're actually, you know, as I mentioned, the methodology, there are inherent limitations of this. So doing the outreach process, going to the effort of 
emailing all the funders, even though it is, you know, quite time consuming between getting all of their email addresses by whatever means, um, waiting for their reply, following up, but it can result in not only you capturing areas that you perhaps missed out on during the actual process itself, but also them, you know, changing policy in real time, which did happen for a couple of items, hence the fact that 21 items were upgraded in that time. Um, in terms of strengths, of course, there it's independent ratings, the review and consolidation by a third person, along with the adjudication, which was carried out by Todd Brunkner, along with, of course, the outreach process, so respondent validation. This overall will strengthen your data quality and reliability. Also, we archived all the project tools and documentations on GitHub, so this enables the independent application, including with any other future cohort. So um, as I mentioned, the European cohort was a replication in this instance. So I did look at the GitHub of the previous study, which was very useful. So that's something to you know keep in mind if you're going to replicate something like this. Also, as I'm going to talk about more in more detail in the next slide, we could already see within not even weeks of the actual publication that was peer reviewed, but even the preprint back in April, we got um, you know positive response from two particular funders not too long after that. So it's the impact of such a study um, can be quite quick and. Obviously, you have to kind of push it with the media. So we did contact the BMJ to do a news article prior to publication, but it just shows that these type of studies, although relatively simple in terms of you know um, statistical analyses and so on, they can have an impact on policy and quite quickly. Um, and there's a visual aid down below that shows um, we sent it to each funder and it will enable them to easily identify gaps in their policies. So this is something to keep in mind when you're doing a study like this, showing that perhaps um, be a trial registration reporting and so on might look bleak. You can go about, you know, remedying this and helping funders. So it's not just about reporting, oh, this is bad, this needs to be improved. Use that communication screen you've set up to actually make an impact and convince the funders to improve things, you know, overall. <clears throat> um, so of course, further limitations, unfortunately, um, 11 funders didn't respond to our, our outreach, despite the fact that it was repeated efforts. So we contacted them multiple times. We also even gave a deadline extension for a couple of funders and they still didn't come back to us. So as a result of this, relevant policy items may have been missed, especially if they weren't publicly accessible online. So everything we, our whole, you know, methodology was limited to what was available online, along with contacting them. And of course, if they didn't contact us, we lost on that information. Um, also, it's important to note that policies may not translate into actual improvements in practice especially if funders don't actively monitor grantees compliance with these requirements. To add to that, um, there was also language barriers, as I alluded to, you know, we were using things like Google Translate, which is open to misinterpretation when you're um, translating policy documents. So that was definitely one of the biggest limitations, I would say, um, during this project. We also didn't reassess funders, so this is something to keep in mind, even though we are doing it um, in 2024, when we published it, they may have already in that length of time um, made things better, improved on their policies, added things, so that's something to note as well. Um, so then in terms of how funders reacted, Um, that with something as simple as this, it actually can have a big impact on policy and quite quickly. So overall, 18 policy items were adjusted post outreach for both for just the European and global cohort alone, not including the US study, which I'm sure was 
even more given that it was the first of its kind. And I'm sure that when it will be reassessed in January or whatever time that is in 2024, we'll see an even more significant improvement across the board. Um, here are two key, key examples that have already gone about improving their policy and giving media statements because of this study. So, for example, with the British Heart Foundation, now bearing in mind we had scored them seven out of 11. So moving forward, they've expressed their intention to ensure all trials they fund adhere to these practices. And this might involve reminding trial teams and the requirements of grant activation. They've also emphasized need for improvement in the disclosure of trial results. So they acknowledge the forthcoming legal requirements by the UK government and their revised policy that stipulates expectation that summary results are posted onto trial registry within a 12 month time frame, which is in line with the guidelines. They've also said that to ensure compliance with their transparency guidelines, they're going to follow up with individual trial teams. So in addition to this, they've also shared lay summaries of findings from trials of funds on their website as soon as it becomes available. So this is again, um, you know, bringing it out to the general public and, you know, not, you know, breaking down that scientific language so patients can benefit from it. And also when you look at the MBF or the German Research Ministry, they're now planning to monitor and document whether researchers researchers meet publication requirements um, and they're also currently reviewing which sanctioning measures would be appropriate and applicable in case researchers don't make trials public within set time frames. So these are only two, you know, I can imagine if we let it until the end of the year and have more time to, you know, digest what we've done, put things into practice which can take time it would we'd have a lot more examples but these came out quite quickly to be honest I think even before this paper was published mid-July um, these two statements had come out so it's you know testament to how quickly these type of papers can have an impact and as I said we gave the template policy document to all funders afterwards so I'm sure that this will further boost up the scores of funders in the next assessment phase. Um, thank you for listening and I'll take any questions now.